It's good to have our visitors tonight, and tonight we are in for a treat because I'm not going to be preaching. We're going to have a guest uh, speaker tonight. Uh, Mike and Terry Roberts are with us. Mike is Jennifer's cousin, and uh, he has two children, and they live in Tig, Texas. He will be planning on going to the Brown Trail School of Preaching in January. He already does a little bit of preaching, and so when we talk to him, we ask, I ask him if he would come in and speak with us uh, or preach to us a little bit. So he is here going to preach uh, a message for us, and we thank you for coming out. Mike Roberts. I'd like to thank you for the invitation to be in here and explain to you that I am not a preacher. That's the reason I am wanting to go to preaching school. I'm a broke down cowboy that, well, this right here, I guess, just kept pushing my direction, so this is what I ended up with. I have been doing a little bit of preaching with the parish congregation, and there they had asked me, instead of quoting scriptures, if I would take and use the Bible and allow them to turn with me. So I hope you all have Bibles because I'm in the process of trying to change the way I do things. And this will help me. I have gotten where I love to study the Old Testament. And all the stories of how God dealt with his people. The very first class that I ever taught was when I was 17 years old and I taught the Old Testament Bible credit course back when you could actually have credits at high school studying the Bible. Romans 15 and 4 says, For whatsoever things were written aforetime were written for our learning, that we through patience and comfort of the Scriptures might have hope. This is the reason I love the Old Testament so much. Because these are not fictitious stories. They're not parables. They're history. And God wrote those down so that I would know how He deals with His people. Paul, writing to Timothy in 2 Timothy 3, 15 through 17, says, Continue thou in the things which thou hast learned and hast been assured of, knowing of whom thou hast learned them, and that from a child thou hast known the holy scriptures, which are able to make thee wise in the salvation through faith which is in Christ Jesus. All scripture is given by the inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. Now I want you to understand, my mother and my grandmother has literally taught me the scriptures since the day I was born. I don't remember a time when they were not throwing the Bible in my direction. And more so my grandmother. You see, she was my babysitter till the day I started school. Once I started school, she was the one that picked me up and brought me home. And I always joked a little bit about the fact that she fed me a bottle with one hand and a bottle with the other. She had a tongue that could tomahawk you to death with one line of scriptures. Anything you did, she had a Bible verse for it. And then my family, my parents, and my granddad supplemented her work. And I have come to realize that when you go to the Old Testament and you study what God wrote, He presents life in all of His glory. It doesn't matter if you want to talk about the bad things of life or the good things of life, it's here. And I would like to introduce this lesson going to Genesis, the 11th chapter. Now for just a little bit of background, because I'm not going to read this whole chapter. Genesis 11 starts out with the Tower of Babel. And the fact that all men spoke one language. 
And God said that all things were possible to them because they were all united. And so he couldn't find their languages. Then he goes from there to the, the bloodline of Shem, the lineage of Shem. And then from there to Terah. Verse 27 is where I want to start. Now these are the generation of Terah. Terah begat Abram, and Nahor, and Haran. And Haran begat Lot. And Haran died before his father Terah in the land of his uh, in the land of his nativity in Ur of the Chaldees. And Abraham and Nahor took them wives. The name of Abraham's wife was Sarai, and the name of Nahor's wife is Milcah, the daughter of Haran, the father of Milcah, and the father of Iscah. But Sarai was barren, and she had no children. And Terah took Abraham, Abram his son, and Lot the son of Haran, his son's son, and Sarai, his daughter-in-law, his son, Abraham's wife, and they went forth with them from Ur of the Chaldees to go into the land of Canaan. And they came upon Haran and dwelt there. And the days of Terah were 205 years, and Terah died. Now this story starts out with Terah leaving on a journey. And the Bible tells us that he intended to go to Canaan. But he didn't make it. He ends up stopping at Haran. And the Bible says that he dwelt there. In other words, he just flat stopped and, and made his living right there. Haran is 500 miles, roughly, from the Ur of Chaldees. It is also 500 miles, roughly, from the land of Canaan. It is the halfway mark. Terah, for reasons we're not told, never got past the halfway mark on his journey to Canaan. And when you stop and think about it, many people and many congregations are just like Terah. They know where they want to go. They know where they need to go. But they stop at the halfway point. Many are living in a land of Haran in the spiritual sense. For example, how many of you have ever started a Bible study, a daily Bible study, or a daily Bible reading? This is a journey that you start, and in my opinion, everybody needs now, I prefer the Bible study because if I just read scriptures, I have a tendency to get lost. But if I'll take, pick up a topic and study for a set hour, I do better. But how many never finish an annual Bible reading? We get busy and we shut down. Stop and think about congregations that you have been a part of over the years. How many different programs can you think of that were started only to see them fail to be completed? They start right and some of them even make some progress on them. But that's it. They never complete the journey all the way to Canaan. The challenge is to reach the goal, which to us as Christians is heaven, and to move ahead. In this lesson, I want to share some fundamental truths around the theme. Halfway ain't far enough. You see, the lesson is for individuals as well as congregations. Halfwayism is hindering our growth. A good beginning is not enough. Yes, it's definitely essential. And the beginning must be right. Run over to John, the third chapter. One of the things I have trouble with, my fingers have been broke so many times that it's hard to grab pages quick. 
In the third chapter, starting with verse 1, here he's talking to Nicodemus, a Pharisee, and he's talking about Nicodemus' beginning. He said, There was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. The same came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that thou art a teacher come from God. For no man can do these miracles that thou doest except God be with him. Jesus answered and said unto him, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, Except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus said unto him, How can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter the second time into his mother's womb and be born? Jesus answered, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, Except a man be born of water and of spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of heaven. Now, run straight over to the 8th chapter of John. And I'm going to hit verse 32, then we're going to catch 36. Actually, I'm going to back up 31. Then said Jesus to those Jews which believed on him, If you continue in my word, then are you my disciples indeed. And you know, and you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. You see, right there, there's our beginning. This book right here is our beginning. There's nothing more perfect than what you have in your lap right there in front of you. There's no error, nothing but truth. That's where we start. In verse 38, uh, 36, he says, If the Son therefore shall make you free, you shall be freed indeed. And I know that ye are Abraham's seed, but ye seek to kill me, because my word hath no place in you. There's the people that are stopping halfway. You see, it took the blood of Jesus Christ in order to get me the opportunity to go on that journey to Canaan. We must be in Christ. There's no other beginning available in the plan of God. Look over to Ephesians. The first chapter. <coughs> Verses 3 and 4. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who hath blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places, according as he hath chosen us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love. Now hit Galatians. Galatians chapter 3. We're going to start at 26. He says, For ye are all the children of God by faith in Christ Jesus. For as many of you have been baptized into Christ and put on Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek, there is neither bond nor free, there is neither male nor female. For ye are all one in Christ Jesus. And if you be Christ, then are ye Abraham's seed and heirs to the promise. There is how we begin. That's where we step out. That is leaving Ur of Chaldees and heading to heaven. We have ever must keep on keeping on once we get here. Too many times we will baptize somebody and then leave them to themselves. I know my granddad worked for years trying to start a program that once we baptized a person, we took them into classes nearly immediately and start growing them, helping them on that journey. The problem we have is before long, they stop at that halfway mark. We can't get them to come and study. I've seen people that were baptized that within a month never darkened the door again. And that's heart sickness. Because they crucified Christ one more time. You know, if you wanted to sum up the book of Revelation in one sentence, 
If you continue to death, you win. God promises that. If you look at Revelation 2.10, he says, Fear none of these things which thou shalt suffer. Behold, the devil shall cast some of you into prison, that ye may be tried. And ye shall have tribulation ten days. Be thou faithful unto death, and I will give thee a crown of life. We've got the promise of God that regardless of what men on this earth does to me, that if I remain faithful to him, I win. But I can't stop halfway. Look over at the Hebrew writers. Hebrew chapter 12. Hebrews 12, and start with verse 1, he declares, he says, Wherefore, seeing we also are compassed about with such so great a cloud of witness, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which does so easily beset us, and let us run with patience the race that is set before us, looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. For consider him that endured such contradiction of sinners against himself, lest you be weary and faint in your mind. Running to the halfway marker. It's not far enough. We got to go all the way with Christ. If you go all the way just to the halfway marker, that is just far enough to take you all the way back to Perdition's Gate. You know, Paul, how many times talked about him running a race? And he finally, there at the end, right before his death, he said, I have finished my race and run the course. He made it all the way. Think about something else. Establishing congregations. Uh, me and Sean were talking about where he just went and the fact that the congregations are none. Starting congregations is a wonderful thing if it's done right. You have to restore that biblical pattern. That's an essential it's not an option. There in John 4, 23 and 24, he says, For the Father seeketh such to worship Him. God is a spirit. And they that worship Him must worship Him in spirit and in truth. That particular passage I had just went over my high school class this morning. We start these congregations, they got to learn how to worship in spirit and in truth. That means they give every bit of them in worship. Body, soul, mind, heart, spirit. That's what God expects in worship. But he doesn't leave it there. He doesn't leave it to my imagination. He doesn't leave it to my opinions or my feelings. He says, in truth. I don't have to ask. It's here. Everything I need for worship. If it pertains to my life or it pertains to godliness, it's given here. That means there's no gray area. If you want to know how to live your life as a Christian, come here. And then follow. Don't stop halfway. Follow it all the way. You see, regardless of what the congregations do, we have to remember the mission is still the same. We live in a lost world. And our whole job is to preach the gospel of Christ. You look at the parable of the sower. Not one time does it say that the sower converted anything. All he did was preach the message. Once I preach the word of God, it's up to those that hear what they're going to do with it. The word's going to convert. 
I'll plant the seed, Sean's going to water it behind me. But the grace of God is offered regardless. Mark 16, 15 and 16. Go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He that believes and is baptized shall be saved. He that believes not shall be condemned. It's very simple. And if somebody wants to argue about whether baptism is necessity, then he doesn't believe. That's what that passage says. If he believes, he's going to put Christ on in baptism. If he doesn't, he's going to be down. He doesn't believe. Attending church service is not enough. Everything that we hear and we learn when we're at worship has to be translated into action. Run over to James, the first chapter. Starting with verse 18, going through 22. Yep. Of his own will beget he us with the word of truth, that we should be a kind of first fruits of his cre uh, creatures. Wherefore, my beloved brethren, let every man be swift to hear, slow to speak, and slow to wrath. For the wrath of man worketh not the righteousness of God. Wherefore, lay apart all filthiness and superfluity of naughtiness, and receive with meekness the engrafted word, which is able to save your souls. But be ye doers of the word, and not hearers only, deceiving your own selves. Since we're so close, let's just run straight over to 1 John. 1 John 2. In verse 17. And the world passeth away, and the lust thereof, but he that doeth the will of God abideth forever. He says, Little children, it is the last time, and as ye have heard, the Antichrist shall come, even now. Or are there many Antichrists, whereby we know that it is the last time. They went out from us, but they were not of us. For if they had been of us, they would no doubt have continued with us. But they went out, that they might be made manifest that they were not of us. This right here God has given us, Jesus has given us the examples. And his love is what perfects our faith. And people want to stop short of that. The reason that a person would get up here is because he loves the souls of men. It's not natural for me to be here. It's natural for me to sit on a horse. But it's just like a man that is in the army. It's not natural for him to charge a gun that's shooting bullets at him. But when a man is trained, and he's trained more and more, it gets to where it becomes natural. You see, Jesus... <coughs> Jesus was never one time shown to be complacent. He was not one time shown to be slothful. And we're not supposed to be either. We can't stop halfway. If we have to, we've got to charge the bullets. We lose our kids so quick. You know what the, the percentage is right now? After graduation of high school, in the first five years, we lose 73% of our children. Because the school teaches them homosexuality is 
an alternative lifestyle? Because their fears pull them and we allow them to go. We can't be slothful. We got to go all the way with our kids. You train up a child in the way he should go, and when he is old, he shall not depart from it. You see, halfway is the envy of the bride of Christ. We must realize our goals. It's easy to write them down. It's even easier to get started. And it's even easier yet to get started and then to quit. Success only comes in completion. Ecclesiastes 7 and 8 says, Better is the end of a thing than the beginning thereof. And the patient in spirit is better than the proud in spirit. Have you ever stopped and thought about the quality of life that we as Christians are to exemplify? The name Christian is precious in the fact that it relates to the Son of God himself and that he has ownership over us and it was through the purchase price of his own blood. Romans 5, 6 through 9. For when we were yet without strength in due time, Christ died for the ungodly. For scarcely for a righteous man will one die, yet peradventure for a good man, some would even dare to die. But God commended his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Much more than being now justified by his blood, we shall be saved from the wrath through him. And yet this name has been applied to things such as schools and organizations in such a shameful way. People call themselves Christians that don't even pretend to walk the book. And yet we have a tendency to turn a blind eye. So many have started out with good intentions, only to lose their purpose halfway down the road. And it's so easy to settle for mediocrities. See, we must set high standards. In our preaching and teaching, we must be at our best. That's the reason we have preaching schools like Brown Trail. So that they can take us and make us as good as we can be. Still not going to be near good enough. But they can help grow us a little farther down the road. You see, in our purity and our ethics... The world must see Jesus living in us. There was a time that members of the body of Christ were known as walking Bibles. But not anymore. And that's a shame. And that's in my lifetime. Matthew 5 and 8, Jesus said, Blessed are the pure in spirit, for they shall see God. We as Christians have to be pure. We're already called out. That's the whole ecclesia of the church. We're called out of this world. We have to be pure. We can't stop halfway. Ask yourself what's wrong with a halfway morality. Like I say, I have taught high school students since I was 17. And I hear what they bring back from home about their moralities. And these parents are teaching halfway morality. And then expect a Bible teacher to save them. My job is just to reinforce what the parents already did. Matthew 6, 24 and 25 this is halfway morality. It, there he says, No man can serve two masters. For either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will hold to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and man. 
Therefore I say unto you, take no thought for your life, what you shall eat or what you shall drink, nor yet for your body, what you shall put on. Is not the life more than meat and the body more than raiment? That's halfway morality. If you're trying to walk that middle line, Jesus said it's impossible. If you believe in the halfway morality, you're on Satan's side. If you're on his side, you're pure, you're holy, just as he is. What about our personal growth? Being half grown is not enough. We would really get nervous if our child at the age of 40 was that tall. But when it comes to the children of God, we kind of accept it as the norm. Look over to Ephesians 4. Ephesians 4, I'm going to start with verse 11 and go through 16. And he gave some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists and some pastors and teachers for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ, till we come, all come in the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God unto a perfect man, unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, so that's where we're supposed to go. To the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, that we henceforth be no more children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the slight of men and cutting craftiness, whereby they lie in wait to deceive. But speaking the truth in love may grow up in him in all things, which is the head, even Christ, from whom the world, uh, from whom the whole body fit jointly together and compacted by that which every joint supplieth according to the effectual working in the measure of every part maketh increase of the body unto the edifying of itself in love. You see, that's where I'm supposed to go. I'm supposed to take and grow to the fullness of Jesus Christ. Yes, when I was a child, I thought as the child, I spake as a child. But as I became a man, I put away the childish things. That's the same thing in our spiritual life. We have to be like Christ. And just like him, we also have to finish our work here on earth. In John 17 and 4, which is the Lord's real prayer, you know, people talk about the Lord's Prayer. This is his real prayer. This is his prayer to God before he leaves. And there in the fourth verse, he says, I have glorified thee on the earth. I have finished the work which thou gave me to do. You know, he said that again. When he was hanging on Calvary's cross, There at the ninth hour of the day, three o'clock, he's hanging there. They've already done all the stuff to him. And at three o'clock, the Jews were killing the Paschal lamb for the Passover. And Christ at the same time looked up. And he said, it is finished. He had finished all the work that Jesus gave him. And then it says, and he gave up the ghost. He left us a perfect example. We are to finish our work. Ephesians 2.10 says we are his workmanship. Created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. My whole job as a Christian is to do good unto all men, especially those of the household of faith. When you look at what 
religion is, Paul, when he told him, he said, pure religion, undefiled before God the Father, is to visit the widows and the fatherless in their afflictions, and then to keep oneself un unspotted from the world. You see, that's our work. That's what we're to do. So why do people settle for halfway? Sometimes it's because we're led halfway. Some don't realize that the real mission is beyond these walls. This is where we come for our strength. But our job is out there. We have turned way too far inward. Jesus never did. He always took and told his twelve, he says, look to the fields for the harvest for it's ripe. The job is out, not in. What I get in here, that's the benefits I get from God for my obedience. In Matthew 15 and 14, Jesus once again talking about this same thing. He said, and if the blind lead the blind, they're both going to fall into the ditch. You've got a road map in front of you. There's no reason for any of us to fall into a ditch. No man should be able to lead us away from this book. Sometimes it's because we're afraid to go beyond halfway. You know, halfway is comfortable. If you're walking up to a fire, halfway you get warm, but if you get on up there, sometimes you get burnt. It's kind of like I was talking about one ago about it being natural to be up here. It's not natural. My comfort zone is me, a horse, and a bunch of cows. People scare me. I'm not used to a bunch of people around me. But sometimes, in order to go all the way, we have to step outside the comfort zone. There's no reason that people should have to beg to have teachers. And I've never been around a congregation yet that didn't have to beg people for teachers. And it always comes up the same thing. Well, I don't know enough. Well, then it's time to teach. You're going to learn ten times what the class does. Especially if you're teaching junior high and up. Because I promise you, you don't study and go in there, they're going to eat you up. They will come up with something that you never thought of. And you grow. You see, God has not given us the spirit of fear. But of power and of love and of a sound mind. 2 Timothy 1.7 Other times it's because the zeal for the journey has just been lost. Run over to Revelation. Revelations 3, 14 through 22. And the, unto the angel of the church of Laodicea, Right. These things saith the Amen, the faithful and the true witness, the beginning of the creation of God. I know thy works, that thou art neither cold nor hot. I would that thou wert cold or hot. So then because thou art lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I will spew thee out of my mouth. Because thou saith I am rich and increased with goods and have need of nothing. And knowest not that thou art wretched and miserable and poor, and blind, and naked. I counsel thee to buy of me gold tried in the fire, that thou mayest be rich, and white raiment, that thou mayest be clothed, and that the shame of thy nakedness do not appear. And anoint thine eyes with eye salve, that thou mayest see. As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten, but zealous therefore, be zealous therefore, and repent. Behold, I stand at the door and knock, if any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come into him 
and will sup with him, and he with me. To him that overcometh will I grant to sit with me in my throne, even as I also overcame, and am set down with my Father in his throne. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. You see, they had a very strong zeal, and then lost it. And God told them, he said, you're not evil, but you're not good. You're lukewarm. And lukewarm's evil. He said, I, I'd rather you be evil than I had for you to be lukewarm. We cannot be complacent. And if you look at the 19th verse there, he tells them, he says, as many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. But be zealous and repent. You see, nothing that we've talked about tonight cannot be fixed. Every bit of it can be fixed, and it's real easy. Sometimes the reason we stop halfway is simply because of the influence of others. Too many times where the other people are seems like the norm. I mean, after all, when you look, there's a whole lot more people out there doing their thing than what we're allowed to do. And it's what God allows, not me. God's the one that says, come out from among them, be ye separate. Touch no unclean thing, and I'll be a father to you. You shall be my sons and daughters. What a wonderful thing that I have a God that will not only accept me, but tell the world that I'm his. And it's so simple to get into. Then there's just procrastination. So many times, we stop halfway simply because we're going to do it tomorrow. My wife's going to get tired of hearing this because this will be the third time in a month that I've told this story. But it's a story I heard from Johnny Ramsey when I was a little bitty boy. He said right after creation and after the fall of man, devil realized when God talked to him that God had a plan. So the devil called all his angels together. He said, we've got a problem. We need to get a solution, and we need to do it now. He says, God has a way of saving men's souls, and we need to stop it. What are we going to do? One of the angels said, send me back down there. He said, what are you going to do? He said, I'm going to go down there and preach to them that there's no God. The devil said, that will not work. All a man has to do is look out at the creation and all the wonders that are made and know that somebody higher than him had to make it. There is a God. Another angel raised his hand. He said, send me down there. He said, what are you going to do? He said, I'm going to go up there and tell them there's no heaven. If there's no heaven, they don't want to do it. They don't want to do what they want to do. The devil said, that won't work. He said, all a man has to do is look in the face of a baby and knows that there's a heaven. One of the old angels sitting back there, he said, here am I, send me. He said, what are you going to do? He said, I'm going to go down there and tell them that they have time. We don't have time. Our friends that we work with does not have time. James 4 and 14 he asked point blank, he said, what is your life? He said, it's but a vapor, here for a little time, then it vanishes away. We do not have a clue what the next second is going to bring us. I could drop dead before the next word. And the question I have to ask is if that happens, where does that leave me? Am I safe inside the blood of Jesus Christ? Have I been faithful in the work that he gave me? 
where will that leave my family? Was I the spiritual leader that I should have been to my kids that saved their souls? Or did I stop halfway and say, I've got time? The question I have is, where are you sitting in that? time to examine yourself. Are you still pushing on down the road or have you vapor locked on the halfway mark? And if you haven't put on Christ, you haven't even started the journey. You're still sitting at the finish line. The question for you is, do you believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God? John 8, 24. Are you willing to repent of your sins? Luke 13, 3. And to confess Him with your mouth? Matthew 10, 32 and 33. And willing to be baptized for remission of your sins? You see, that is the only way that you can even start this journey that I'm talking about. And those of you that are already Christians here tonight. Are you willing to push on for God? You can make this building overflow. Our missionaries have been doing it for years. Do you realize that in Africa right now, there are more churches and more preachers than there are in the United States and we're still sending missionaries over there Christian Chronicle here I guess it's been a year now they have predicted that within three years time Africa is going to be sending missionaries here there's no need in it we can't stop that way if we can help you tonight Will you please come as we stand and sing?